Hello, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you, Father, that you have watched over us throughout last night, that you kept us safe, that you got us up this morning, and that you gave us a heart and a mind to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We pray now, Father, that you would bless this church, the Greater Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. We pray that you would bless each and every member. We pray, Father, that we might become the kind of church that you have called us to be, and that is a Christ-centered church where others would come to know you through your darling son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for this day that you have made and for allowing us to be a part of it. We thank you for this church. We thank you, Father, for this neighborhood, for this community, for the city, the county, and for the state as well as this nation in which we live. We pray, Father, for all those that are in positions of leadership and stewardship and that are responsible for making decisions, Father, to lead and to guide your people in the way that they should go. We pray now that you would continue to bless those that are sick and shed in. Bless those, Father, that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones, that are feeling disheartened and downtrodden. Help, Father, to lift them up. Have them to know, Father, beyond the shadow of a doubt that you promised in your word that you would never leave them, nor will you ever forsake them. We pray, Father, all those that are grieving and heartbroken concerning the many issues that we see around our world, the issues concerning the potential for a rise, a return in the global pandemic, the issues concerning all the senseless violence and chaos and killings, Father, that we see throughout our nation and throughout our world. We pray, Father, for those that are overseas, especially those in Ukraine and in Russia that are dealing with the wars and the senseless wars and the atrocities that are being committed against your, your creation. We pray, Father, that you would help us to understand that you called us not to destroy one another, but to demonstrate our love for one another through our love for you. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless us. We thank you for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into, back into heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for the life, the eternal life, that now through faith in him, we too can have. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Again, I thank you for joining us and I thank you for your participation as we continue in our summer 2024 quarterly study and our topic has been hope in the Lord. And so that brings us to our unit two series of lessons, which is entitled Expressing Hope. And for today's study, we want to look at the July 21st, 2024, Lesson 8, which is entitled Delightful Precepts, as we will read from Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 80 of the New International Version of the Bible. And as we look on our screen for today, we'll see that our lesson outline is divided into two teaching outlines. Our first outline has to do with God and his pupils from Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 76. Our second outline has to do with hope for the future as we read from Psalms number 119, verses 77 through 80 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so that brings us to our lesson scripture, which should be on our screen, as we read Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 80 of the New International Version of the Bible, which is uh, entitled Delightful Precepts. And this comes from a section that is known as the Yod the Y-O-D-H in the Hebrew. And so let's begin at Psalms 119, verse 73. And it begins as follows. Your hands made me and formed me. 
Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassions come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so next on our screen, we'll look at our lesson context uh, for our lesson number eight, which is entitled The Light for Pro the Precepts, as we have read from Psalms number 119, verses 73 through verse 80 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so our lesson context is divided into two parts. Our first part has to do with the introduction and the title, The Power of Knowledge. And so let's begin reading part A. The statement, knowledge is powerful, can mean many different things. Awareness of how we are being misled gives us freedom from outside control. Possessing the right skills allows a person to lead or even dominate others. Or withholding information from others can allow us to control them. The vagueness of this proverb reminds us that knowledge can, be many, can take many forms and serve many purposes. A better statement, though, might be knowledge can support goodness. Instead of thinking of knowledge as the path to power, might we think of knowledge as a way of learning to do good and build a better world? Some forms of knowledge and methods of acquiring knowledge have great potential for good. Knowledge comes to us, of course, through some process of education, whether formal or elsewhere. Healthy patterns of education draw together good teachers and eager students working around a series of questions and concerns that will produce knowledge and transform the lives of those involved in the learning process. In wisdom scripture like Psalms 119 verses 73 through 80 or the book of Proverbs or Job, the disciplined pursuit of knowledge involves all sorts of concerns. A wise person might study many things, ranging from what we would call the sciences to languages to arts and craft, but most of all, the wise person described in Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 80, or the book of Proverbs or Job's cultivates the art of living. And so let's read part B, which has to do with our lesson context for today's study, which has to do with delightful precepts, as we have read from Psalms number 119, verses 73 through verse 8 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's begin reading our lesson context. Psalms 119, verse 73 through 80, takes up the art of living in an almost obsessive way as it repeatedly turns to the same ideals and figures of speech. Psalms 119 verses 73 through 80 emphasizes the law of Moses, which is also called the Torah, as a guidebook to a life of dignity and moral integrity uh, <clears throat> So Psalms 119, verse 73 through 80, invites faithful people to delight in such a life, not merely endure it. 
Now in Psalms 119 is by far the longest poem in the Bible. It length is due in part to the psalmist's decision to write an acrostic psalm in which lines would begin with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This technique was a form used to display a comprehensive approach to the subject of the poem. The same convention appears in various forms of other Old Testament texts, such as Psalms number 37, Psalms number 111, Psalms number 112, and in the book of Lamentations, chapters 1 through 4, among others. Now, Psalms 119 takes the form to its extreme by including eight consecutive lines beginning with the same Hebrew letter. In English, this would mean eight poetic lines that start with the letter A, then eight more with B, and so on. And so 22 Hebrew alphabets multiplied by eight lines equals to 176 verses that are found in Psalms number 119. And so while the alphabetical structure section are relatively self-contained, several themes and keywords repeatedly appear throughout this psalm. This include various words for the law of Moses, such as commands in Psalms number 119, verse 73, laws in Psalms number 119, verse 75, precepts in Psalms number 119, verse 78, which is the title of our lesson, decrees in Psalms number 119, verse 80, and etc and the response of the faithful person to the law, such as delight in Psalms number 119, verse 77, in comfort, Psalms number 119, verse 76, and etc. So in Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 80, expressions of such idea, all the verses in Psalms 119, verse 73 through 80, begins with the Hebrew letter Yod. And Yod is pronounced Yod, is the smallest Hebrew letter. It means arm or hand and often represents a hand reaching toward heaven in prayer or a person humbly bowing down in prayer. It is part of all the other Hebrew letters and therefore in every Hebrew word. Psalms 119, verse 73 through 80, focuses on the psalmist's hope and prayer for a future that will be better than the past. Like Psalms number 71, Psalms 119, verses 73 through 80, portrays God as the head teacher and the human being praying to God as the student in the school of life. The student learns the commandments, the law of Moses, not merely as a set of arbitrary rules, but as a window into the meaning of life. By providing a clear structure to everyday life, the law, which is the law of Moses, or the God's word, invites a person to inner peace and openness to the work of God, who is the creator. These commandments rest on God's prior commitment to justice, often paired with or assumed to accompany God's righteousness. God's deep desire for a fair and fertile world for human beings underlines everything in the revelation that was given on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, which is the 10th commandment and other revelations that occurred there as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt or had been delivered from the Egypt, uh, Egyptian uh, 430 years of slavery and was en route to the promised land and where they met their God there in Exodus chapter 20 and God gave them the 10th commandment. And it can underline everything the Ten Commandments or the law of God can in human life. And so Psalms 119, verse 73 through 80, affirms this principle. 
as we look at now our lesson outline, which has to do with our first topic, which has to do with a request for wisdom. As we read Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 76 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's read our first subtopic, which has to do with God and his pupils. As we read Psalms number 119, verses 73 through 74. And let's begin reading as follows. <clears throat> Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. And so we, and verse 74 says, May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. Now in verse 73a of Psalms number 119, with this phrase, your hands made me and formed me, the psalmist uses a common practice of ascribing human traits to God, which is called anthropomorphism. Even though the reader would know that God is a spirit and does not have human, a human physique, such as we see in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5, also in Numbers chapter 6, verse 25, and Psalms number 34, verse of 15 and etc. Now the word Y-O-D-H or Yod section opens by confessing belief in God as the great creator. The psalmist is represented of any person who acknowledges God's work in the world that God created, which begins by giving life to every creation or every creature therein as we look at and study in the book of Genesis. And so the Hebrew word that's translated uh, yod, uh, it's translated form, emphasizes the ongoing nature of God's work. It could be paraphrased and say that you put the finished touches on me. So God's created work continues in each individual life through creation as well as through the recreation process, such as we see in Psalms number 119, verses 13 through 16, in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6, also in the book of Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, and even in the Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Now, in verse 73b of Psalms 119, the psalmist here prays or he asks God for the gift of understanding the life that God created and formed. As James would point out in James' book, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, and I quote, If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given unto you. And so this psalmist really is asking God for the wisdom to understand uh, the commandments and to understand the nature of God's creatures or God's creation. And so human beings desire to understand or desire to have wisdom. Uh, this plea is for God to take up the role as a head teacher in Psalms number 25, verses 4 and 5 which he says, and I quote from Psalms number 25, verses 4 and 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truths and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day. Also, we see in Psalms number 86, verse 11, it quotes, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And so as the creator, God knows all things and cares deeply for all creatures. Therefore, God is in the best position to teach a person how to live a godly life. The psalmist asks for God or prays for God's help to grow in knowledge, especially about his commands and their requirements, as we see in Psalms number 119, verse 80, as we read through our lesson study today. 
So in essence, the psalmist is praying and asking God for wisdom, the knowledge to understand and to apply these truths in, in his daily life or in his life as he tries to live out a life that's pleasing to God. Like Psalms number one and Psalms number 19, and Psalms number 119, verse 73, this, these passages assume that God's law are not simply orders that compliant people obey without questions or feelings, but that God's commandments invite the believer into a world of holiness, or wholeness as well as wonder. Understanding God's commandments, meaning and interconnections, requires a life of attentiveness that requires God's help if comprehension or if wisdom is to be the result. The psalmist knows that he is a creature made by a loving God whose commands give him understanding. We have a choice, and that choice is to look to God for wisdom to live lives that glorify God or to look to our own desires and face lives of boundless and face our lives of boundless danger. Which path do you choose? As for me, I choose to live a life that, uh, that glorifies God. Now in verse 34, Psalms number 119, verse 74, introduces those who fear God. In Psalms number 119, verses 79, as well as verse 63. Now, those who fear God share the psalmist's confidence in God's promises, as we see in Psalms number 33, verses 18 through 22. And they rejoice in finding a like-minded person like the psalmist. Their word, they would rejoice because they recognize the truth of the psalmist's hope in God's word, not human sources of knowledge or wisdom as Paul advises the Corinthians there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. And so Psalms number 119, verse 74, underscores the nature of a faithful community of those believers or followers of God, or believers in God, as well as those followers of Christ Jesus. And this faithful community that God has called out exists because it is founded or it has found hope in God's promises or in God's word or in God's laws and commandments. Leaning uh, and learning from a divine revolution, the vastness of God's care uh, for the creation of each human being in it. And so that is the a, a revelation that they have received from God through studying his word, the vastness of God's care for all of his creation and each human being that God has placed in his world that he has created. And so the members of this faithful community, which are those that believe and trust in God's word, have come to see the world as potentially good. They find their lives meaningful. This is why they rejoice in finding a like-minded person like the psalmist. Also, we see that in Luke's gospel, chapter 15, verse 7, concerning the church there and Jesus' teaching, as well as Paul writing in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. And so this emphasis on acceptance by other faithful people contrasts with the theme in Psalms of lament, of persecution by evil people, which we saw in last week's study as we studied from Psalms number 73, verses 12 through 21. And so our next subtopic has to do with trust in God as we look at verses 75 through 76, which are on our screen. And so let's read our next uh, subtopic, trust in God, from Psalms number 119, verses 75 through 76. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promises to your servant. Now in Psalms number 119, verses 75a, the A part, 
Alongside words of hope comes words of evaluation and reformation, which we'll see in Psalms 119, verses 75, verse 75b. The phrase, your laws are righteous, go hand in glove with just laws, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20. Not only are God's law righteous, but God's law are also just. And so the image of the righteous life as followed a straight and narrow path is fitting as we see Jesus teaches in his Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew Gospel, chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. So following God's instruction creates the conditions required for human beings to thrive. God's prescribed patterns of life create in those following them a commitment to just dealing with all other people, or all other human beings, as God instructed through Moses' teaching there in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. This is without which no one can please God. In other words, without God's instruction and without God's commitment and without God's compassion and God's mercy, no one can please God. As we see what God desires of man in the book of Michael chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, as well as in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Now, in verse 75b of Psalms 119, the psalmist perceives God's judgment as naturally flowing from God's faithfulness. If God did not judge sin, he would be unfaithful to his character as well as to his word. As we see in Psalms number 33, verse 4, also in the book of Revelations, chapter 19, verse 11. God has rightly afflicted, and that affliction comes with a sense of being humble, as we see in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3. And so the psalmist is praying for God through his affliction and through the psalmist's humility that he would understand God's word and apply these truths into his life. And so humility before God, as the psalmist prays to God with humility, is always the appropriate posture for his creatures, and a humble person accepts the resulting suffering that may come from living in the life in the life in this body or in this body as an opportunity for growth. As James points out in James chapter 4, verse 10, and I quote James chapter 4, verse 10, which says, Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so God does not shy away from allowing his students to struggle in order to learn important lessons, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 28. And the faithful student in God's school of life recognizes adversity as a chance not only to learn, but also to grow. And so the psalmist here has personally experienced the judgment of the Lord when he lost his way, we see in Psalms number 119, verse 67. And so suffering, though, may be punishment for sin, or it may come undeserved from some evil persons. The psalmist prays prayer here, or the psalmist is praying in seeking forgiveness from God, as David prayed in Psalms number 51, verses 10 through 17 or also seeking deliverance from those enemies that may be pursuing the faithful community or the faithful person of God. In Psalms number 55, verses 1 through 3. Now, in Psalms number 119, verse 76, the phrase, the unfailing love of God, is better understood as the expression of God's covenant loyalty. It comes from a deep relationship based on God's promises and a human being acceptance of those promises. An example is just as Abraham and Sarah had a child named Isaac in their old age after they trusted God to do the impossible, which we see in Genesis chapter 21, verses 3 through 7. The psalmist stand in a relationship of deep trust in the creator, the God who promised comes true in time. 
The phrase, according to your promises to your servant, assumes that God promised to console and that God promised to be counted on, or that God promises can be counted on. Based on the summer's knowledge of God's promises, he asks that God in mercy will work to comfort the summons amid his suffering. God provides proper support when the lesson is the hardest to learn. But the person of faith can count on God's statement of favor as well as promises that God makes to deliver. Just as Moses did when he was praying to God to forgive the Israelites after the episode of the golden calf in Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 16. And so we look at our second outline, which has to do with hope for the future. As we read Psalms number 119, verses 77 through 80 of the New International Version of the Bible. And our second subtopic or our first subtopic in our second uh, outline has to do with the righteous and the wicked. As we read verses 77 through 78 of Psalms 119, which are on our screen. And so let's begin reading at verse 77. Let your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause. But I will meditate on your precepts. And so in verse 77, the idea that God shows compassion is common to the book of Psalms in those a list of prayers and all that's laid out in the book of Psalms. And text about Israelite worshiping more generally, which we see in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, as well in the book of Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 31, and also in Psalms number 111, verse 4, and number 112, verse 4, and etc. in the book of Psalms. So without, without God's compassion and his mercy, no one could survive or even thrive. Now, in verse 77b, the psalmist phrase, or the phrase here that says, for your law is my delight, explain the basis for the prayer and the confidence that God will answer prayer that the psalmist have. The psalmist takes delight in God's law. The faithful human beings find delight in God's commandment because God's commandment can preserve life, it can protect from various enemies and provide stability in an unstable world, which certainly we live in today. The instructions is wise and righteous living that the Torah that was given to Moses there uh, for the children of Israel benefit in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And I read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 uh, and 2. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. And so this provides, as well as fosters joy or delight in the person dedicated to following those laws or those precepts of God. That person who pursues life in and with God will experience joy, even amidst trial, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, when he encourages the Thessalonians, or the, those in Thessalonica, to rejoice always, to pray continually, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so far from being a burden that is to be endured, God's laws or his precepts orients a faithful person to a deeply meaning pattern of life as we see in Psalms number one, verses one through three, as we talk about the upright person. 
And so by taking seriously the role of the student, as we see in Psalms 119, verse 73b, the psalmist enters into a deep a, or a deeper relationship with God. This relationship is filled with delight in learning God's ways. Now, in verse 78 of Psalms 119, the phrase, wrong me without cease, can, without cause, I mean, the phrase, wrong, wronging me without cause, can be understood as slandering or lying like cheating, which we see in the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 5. In doing so, the arrogant person here are those that disrespect the laws of God or the word of God, brought the righteous person harm. And so by med uh, meditating on God's precept here, the psalmist can avoid becoming a perpetrator of the abuse but they suffered at the hands of others. In other words, rather than him repaying abuse with abuse, the psalmist meditates on God's word and asks God to give him wisdom and understanding of how to apply his word in this situation that he may be going through. So God's precepts provide a different mindset and pattern of life for this faithful person. We can imagine how if all people were striving to keep God's precepts, which are God's laws, God's commandments, God's ordinance, God's word, and all of the things in God's, in, in God's word, we would be more protected against evil. But even without others committing to a righteous path of life, those who choose this righteous path of life can learn to reject unjust words and actions and find a centered, joy-filled, meaningful life even during their times of troubles here. And so next we see as we look at our next subtopic for our second outline, which is entitled Trust in God, as we read verses 79 and 80 of Psalms 119, beginning with verse 79. It reads as follows. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. Now here in Psalms 119, verse 79, 79 it picks up the theme of Psalm 119, verse 74 which says it brings this yodel or this prayerful section of the psalm is full circle as we see in Psalms 119 verse 80. The focus turns from the individual back to the group. It invites anyone listening to join the psalmist in God's way of life, to enroll in God's school of life. The believing congregation hearing Psalms 119 verse 79 which talks about those who fear you, God, should turn to the psalmist and join in this psalm of worship. As Jeremiah points out in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 19, and I quote, Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, worthy not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. So these fellow worshipers have the correct stance toward God and the correct knowledge. They are fellow students of their creators, aware of their long legacy of God's promises and its fulfillment or his fulfillment to his chosen people, the nation of Israel, in the history of this nation. They are steep in its stories and ethical and spiritual commitments. Now, in verse 8, this Yod, the section ends by praying for help in learning the right attitudes and disposition of the heart. In Psalms 119, verse 73, it says, Your hand made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commandments. So the psalmist is asking for the wisdom to understand God's commandments that he may apply it in, apply them in the school of life that he's involved in 
as God being the head teacher. And so this phrase in Hebrew can apply that of being perfect or perfection or blameless, as we see concerning Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, concerning Noah and the flood, where it says that Noah was blameless, and so God counted that as being righteous, and God allowed Noah to be the one to, uh, to pretty much preserve the world and prepare for this coming of this great flood. And so being without blemish or spot, it could also mean that as we see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, and Numbers chapter 19, verse 20, where the Israelites were to bring a, 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 a offering that was uh, without spot or without blemish. Or it could mean such things as sincerity, as we see in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, and I quote Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. It says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Joshua would also would say, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so their attitude matters as much as their method of thinking or the results of learning God's decrees or God's precepts. All of these elements must go together for the educational experience to be successful. And that educational experience is quoted in Psalms number 119, verse 80, is that I may not be put to shame. And so the psalmist is fully committed to learning and carrying out the details of God's precepts. In doing so, he will not suffer social stigma or be humiliated. The person who wholeheartedly follows God's decrees join a great cloud of like-minded persons across the ages, as we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And that is joining those that have been faithful throughout their ages in their worshiping and serving and trusting and believing in God. And so let's conclude, let's conclude our lesson today with this thought. Learning to trust and trusting to learn. And so let's read our conclusion together. The psalmist did not simply obey rules. He enjoyed a relationship with God. That relationship was full of dignity and moral depth. The law of Moses was not just a set of rules, but a guide to a meaningful life. God's laws contains the secret of spiritual growth for the people of Israel and to a certain extent in the New Testament for the believers in Christ Jesus as well. We affirm this when we learn from the writers of scriptures who grew and learned because of their reverence or their respect of God's law. A life of obedience should not be burdensome, but joyful. Still, Psalms 119 acknowledges the presence of hostile forces. In this case, fellow human beings who sought to righteous person, who sought the righteous person's harm in some unspecified way. The pursuit of wise living does not guarantee that one will enjoy universal respect. In fact, when we seek God and follow his ways, we should expect to be very unpopular, at least sometimes. Yet the faithful person perseveres without fear or anger, confident in the ultimate triumph of God's mercy and his goodness. Beyond the psalmist, these verses assume the extent or existence of a faithful community of like-minded people. Their trust, they trusted each other and worked toward building a better world that expect goodness from its creator. They did, they did so in part by fostering a life of celebration. While they did not ignore or pretend away the negative dimensions of life, they saw something more behind them. Their hopeful, trusting attitude inspires us to live similarly. Such an education requires faithful persons to free themselves of fear, prejudice, anger, greed, lust, and other vices. 
One of the principal causes of social discord in modern society is the loss of trust in others and their horrible and their honorable intentions. Certainly, some people cannot be trusted, but an attitude of mistrust can spread like cancer and divide even those whose actions are honorable and whose intentions are good. In resisting to such tendencies, Psalms 119 and others like it open the door to the possibility of mutual trust. This stance of informed, reasonable trust begins with trusting God as the creator and educator who draws anyone willing into a meaningful life. That stance allows us to learn from others, to check our pride, and to weed out our prejudice and fears. In short, true education for life requires trust. Only then can uh, we delight in God because our reality, because a rea rea reality in our lives. And so only then can the delight in God become a reality in our life. Our thought for to remember for today's study is this. Learn what the Lord desires. The writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, and I quote, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such oppositions from sinners, so that you may grow weary, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Let us close today's study with prayer. Father, we thank you for the psalmist writings here in Psalms number 119, as we have read verses 73 through 80. We thank you, Father, that he put his hope and he put his trust and that he delights in your word or in your precepts, your laws and your commandments and your statutes and your ordinance and everything that you prescribe for human beings to live a life that can bring glory and honor to your name and bring dignity and respect in their lives and that they will not be made ashamed. Help us to look to Jesus who demonstrated all of these traits and characteristics. And now through our faith in him, we too can enjoy not only a life of honor here on earth, but we can enjoy a life eternal when never Jesus returns as he promised. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Thank you again for your participation. I pray God, I pray God will continue to bless, keep you and your family safe. Have a great day.